we left off on around 394. <clears throat> Elizabeth, Mr. Hooper's fiance, is talking with him. And she says, top of the page, you know, there's nothing terrible in this crate that is the fabric he has hanging over his head. Except it hides a face which I'm always glad to look upon. Let the sun shine from behind the cloud. First lay aside your black veil, then tell me why you put it on. Okay. Notice all these little different descriptive terms. She says, it hides a face, let the sun shine from behind the cloud, lay aside your black veil, then tell me why you put it on. Sun shining, hiding clouds, etc. So light, dark, obscurity, clarity. And he replies with a Smile that glimmered faintly. Now, if a light glimmers, what does it do? Because that's the only thing you use that verb for. Right. Glimmer has to do with light. It's brief. It's, it's not bright. These lights are not glimmering. If we were to turn them way, way down, or if we had a candle in here that had a tiny wick, so you didn't have a big flame on it. That would be a glimmer. Notice his smile glimmers faintly. And he replies, There is an hour to come, said he, when all of us shall cast aside our veils. Take it not amiss, beloved friend, if I wear this piece of crepe till then. Okay. She asked him for what? Tell me why you put it on. He doesn't do that. Okay. So... There's an hour to come when all of us shall cast aside our veils. Now that hour can be understood individually or collectively. Individually, when we die. When you die, you will cast aside that veil. What's the veil? The veil that separates life from death. Harry Potter novels, if you've read the Harry Potter novels, it's book five in the Department of, uh, in the Ministry of Magic, in the Department of Mysteries, when Harry goes down into the room that has an archway, it has a veil. Okay? Hold on, Justin. He has a friend fall through that veil and disappear. Never shows up again. Okay? Or it can be read collectively in the world when everybody, quote unquote, dies. So, she says, all right, your words are a mystery too. The veil's a mystery, I don't understand that. We talked about what the word mystery means or entails the other day. It's something that cannot be resolved. Something that cannot be solved by human reason. Your words are a mystery too. Take away the veil for them at least. That is, make the meaning clear. All right? He says, I will so far as my vow may suffer me. What vow? What's a vow, first of all? Say you're going to get married. <clears throat> you do get married. And you have wedding vows. What are those vows? I don't mean what are the words involved. What do those vows convey? What are you doing to that other person? Give me a verb. Louder? You're promising them. You are swearing to them, okay? So that's what a vow is. So a vow is something sworn to somebody. Who's he sworn the vow to? God? Possibly. Anybody in the community? Nope. Because they're all clueless as to why he's wearing this. Okay? Know then, this veil is a type and a symbol. And I am bound to wear it ever, both in light and darkness, in solitude and before the gaze of multitudes. And as with strangers, so with my familiar friends. No mortal eye will see it withdrawn. This dismal shade must separate me from the world. Even you, Elizabeth, can never come behind it. Okay? So, he says it's a type and a symbol. And we started to talk, I think, the other day, Wednesday, about types and symbols. 
keep in mind, what is his occupation? What's he do for a living? He's a preacher, okay? So he uses language that is familiar to preachers. He uses this idea of type. Why? Because the Old Testament is full of types of Christ. So what is meant by that, by a type? It's a person who is a kind of a incomplete representation of something that will be fulfilled, completed, perfected later. So for example, here are three Old Testament types. Okay? They find their fulfillment in the person of Christ. Moses, Samson, David. Okay? Moses, why? He led the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage, into freedom, into the promised land. Just as Christ leads his children out of bondage, sin, out of Egypt, death, into the promised land. Okay? Samson. How is Samson a type of Christ? Samson, after all, marries a woman he shouldn't marry. Tells her his secret. You know, my strength's in my hair. Gets his hair cut off. Loses his strength. What does he do as a result of that? Destroys the Philistines and their gods. Just as Christ destroys false gods, okay? David, who is called the friend of God, okay? Is David perfect? No, he's got this little problem named Bathsheba, a woman he falls in love with who's already married, has her husband killed, etc. Okay? Now there's another way that Moses is also a type of Christ. And, and really fits with this notion of type here. He says the symbol is a type. What did Moses have to put on after he came down from Mount Sinai? Talking with God for 40 days. Comes down with the Ten Commandments. He has to put a veil over his face. Why? Light shining through him. So that when he comes down, the people are like this. They can't bear to see that shining. He has to put the veil so they can come up and approach him. Okay? So he says the veil is a type. That is, it points to something that will be fulfilled, completed, perfected later. And it's a symbol. It represents something. Right? And he says, I have to wear it all the time. Ever. Ever means what? 24-7, 365, till he dies. He says, in light and darkness, during the day, during night, in solitude, and before the gaze of multitudes. Even when I'm by myself, in my home, when he's taking a bath, all the time. When he's asleep, he has the veil on. Right? No mortal eye will see it withdrawn. Now you can infer that mortal there, he means human. But mortal means living. So animals won't ever see his face. Nothing, he says, will ever see it lifted. And she asks, what grievous affliction hath befallen thee? Grievous affliction, like illness. What horrible illness has happened? Because I think by that she's implying, what's wrong with your mind, you know? That you should thus darken your eyes forever. Why darken his eyes? Pull out the veil and hold it over your face like this. Everything you see, you see kind of shadowed. Okay? But I think there's another reason. Paul, in one of the Corinthians books in the New Testament, talking about resurrection, 
says, now, meaning here on earth, now we see but through a glass darkly. And by glass, he doesn't mean like a window. He means like these. Because they knew how to grind glass to look through it. Pretty sure they did. Now we see but through a glass darkly. But then, then when? After death. Resurrected. Then we shall see face to face and know as we are known. Okay, so notice what Paul's doing there. Here, we see, if you look at those windows over there, it's not, you can't see it as clearly now as you could earlier. The windows are covered with a film, with haze. He's saying, that's how we see. It'd be like these glasses, if I had a pail of muddy water here and I dipped them in. He's saying, that's how we see down here. But once we're dead, we will see how. Perfectly. Pointed out in my first class, in the Harry Potter novels, when you get to the seventh and final Harry Potter novels, and you get almost to the end, Harry wakes up in a chapter called King's Cross. And he wakes up, and he realizes two things. One, he doesn't have any glasses. And he can see perfectly. Books one through that point in book seven, you take away Harry's glasses, he's blind as a bat. Two, he doesn't have a scar anymore. Kind of resurrection -y image imagery. Okay? So, I lost my place here. She asked that question about seeing darkly. So we see now darkly, but then we will see perfectly. So now what did he say again? It's a type and a symbol. She says, what grievous affliction hath befallen you that you should thus darken your eyes forever? What has caused you to darken your eyes? Well, if you take that passage from St. Paul, we all have darkened eyes. So she's kind of saying, what's happened that has made your eyes even darker, that has made you even blinder? Okay? And he says, if, if always implies it's a condition, this might not be the case. If it be a sign of mourning, maybe... I'm wearing this to show I'm in mourning. Black veils, totally appropriate for wedding, uh, weddings. Funerals, sorry. White veils for weddings. Um, if it be a sign of mourning, I perhaps, like most other mortals, have sorrows dark enough to be typified by a black veil. So, if you want to take it as being symbolic of mourning, then I've got sorrows that can be represented by that. What color does Hamlet wear? Black. He says, "'Tis not my inky cloak alone, dear mother, that shows what's going on inside." Okay? So, maybe I've got sorrows in my past that I can signify with this black veil. She goes, okay. But what if the world will not believe that it is the type of an innocent sorrow? Innocent, without sin. Some sorrow that has nothing to do with some kind of sin that you're holding on to from the past. Some other kind of sorrow. Loss of a loved one, right? Because that's not sin. Sorrowing over the loss of a loved one. Notice. What if the people out there think you're trying to hide something? Beloved and respected as you are, there may be whispers. Maybe. What did the people start doing as he was making his way to church the previous day? They already started congregating in little groups and whispering. We heard them. We heard them say things such as, something must surely be amiss with person 
with Mr. Hooper's intellects. Right? We hear, I don't like it. He's changed himself into something awful. We hear, are you sure it is our person? And several other things. And when he finishes his sermon and the service is over in the morning, people can't wait to get out of there. Why? So they can get together in their little groups and whisper. So the whispering's already happening. There may be whispers, but now she tells us what they might be whispering about. That you hide your face under the consciousness of secret sin. In other words, you're not a good enough poker player. You're not a good enough liar to show your face in public after what you've done. I don't, you can run with the theories of what the secret sin is if you want to. No. For the sake of your holy office, do away this scandal. This holy office, he's the preacher. Okay? This is a small town, probably a hundred. One church. For the sake of your church, you can't let people be scandalized. Okay? And we're told he smiles again. Same sad smile which always appeared like a faint glimmering of light, proceeding from the obscurity beneath the veil, like the veil lifts just a little bit to let a little bit of light out. And he says, if I hide my face for sorrow, there is cause enough. So first, if it's for mourning, now if it's for sorrow. And if I cover it for secret sin, what mortal might not do the same? If I cover it for secret sin, what mortal might not do the same? In other words, name the mortal who shouldn't do that. I think what Hawthorne's doing here, through the voice of the minister, is he's having the minister probably think, excuse me, of a biblical example. But he doesn't want to come right out and use that biblical example, so he casts it in different terms. The biblical example is when Christ one day is sitting in or near the temple, and a bunch of men bring a woman caught in adultery before him. And I mean caught in adultery. They pulled her off of some man in bed, dragged her, threw her on the ground in front of him. I mean, that's the image that the gospel accounts give. And they say, Master, Moses said we should stone her. What do you say we should do? And Jesus leans down on the ground, writes with his finger in the dust. We don't know what he writes. He just, we're just told he writes with the He might write something like, you know, these idiots, I wish they'd leave me alone. Whatever he's writing. And he turns up after a few minutes, looks at him. Anybody know what he says? Let him who has not sinned throw the first stone. Because the Old Testament law is, she needs to be stoned. Stoned isn't gentle, you know. It's not an easy way to die. You have to put somebody up against the wall, and everybody picks up a rock, and they start hitting and even if you're bad aim, you hit 30, 40, 50 people all throwing rocks, eventually the person gets hit. And once they're down, okay, what do you think the, his auditor's reaction is? You know, they start dropping the rocks, go, damn, you know, I really wanted to bash your brains in. The good religious people of the day. Okay? How does that fit? If I cover it for secret sin, what mortal might not do the same? Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Well, who's the only one, according to the biblical account, there who is without sin? Uh, that would be Jesus. And what does he not elect to do? He doesn't bash your head in. He says, go and sin no more. Notice, he doesn't say, oh, it's okay, don't worry about it. He says, yeah, it was sinful. Just stop. Here, what's he suggesting? 
everybody's pissed off at me because I'm wearing this black veil. Maybe everybody else needs to put the veil on. Why? Because everybody else actually has a veil. It's just not visible. All right? And with this gentle but unconquerable obstinacy did he resist all her entreaties. All her entreaties? She doesn't stop after that one. She keeps trying. She keeps trying to figure out a way to get him to just whip, just, you know, whip, just slowly. Or excuse me, quickly. <clears throat> For a few moments, she appeared lost in thought. This is after she sat silent. At length, she sat, she finally shut up and just sat there with him. Considering what new methods might be tried to withdraw her lover from so dark a fantasy, which, if it had no other meaning, was perhaps a thing he's gone crazy. Though of a firmer character than his own, the tears rolled down her cheeks. Firmer character means he is more prone to tears and crying than she is. In an instant, as it were, a new feeling took the place of sorrow. Her eyes were fixed insensibly on the black veil. Insensibly means... She's looking, but she's not thinking of the black veil. Her mind is elsewhere, though she's looking at it. When, like a sudden twilight in the air, its terrors fell around her. Have you ever noticed yourself, you know, your, your mind's wandering and you're looking at something and your eyes kind of play tricks on you and it looks like that thing is either closer or farther away than it is? That's what she does. Okay? And notice... Its terrors fell around her. It's like she, in insensibly looking at this, it's like the veil. Here's Elizabeth. Here's Parson Hooper. It's like the veil goes around her now. And what she sees, she sees through the veil. Its terrors, we're told, fell around. She rose and stood trembling and goes, yeah, now you get it. And do you feel it then at last? What's the it? What's the it that she feels? What's the it that he feels? Because Hawthorne's never going to tell us. He's going to leave it up to us to try to infer what that is, or to deduce what that is. She gets up, and what does she do? She covers her eyes with her hand. Why? To get her hand between her eyes and that veil. She's trying to hide herself from it. It's almost like the veil has become something other it has its own power. This is why I mentioned Moses and the veil. When Moses comes down from the mountain <clears throat> and his face is shining, what's his face shining from? Because he's been under a heat lamp for a whole lot, a big long time, because God shining on him has made him super tan? No. He's shining because he's reflecting God's glory that he experienced. And the people do what? Why? Because they don't want to see it. Because it says what about them? Well, I don't shine like that. Well, why not? Well, because I've not been privileged to be in the presence of God, you know, blah, 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 blah. It's an example, I think, of Hawthorne essentially saying, the veil serves as what Hamlet described, because this works as one. The veil serves as what? It's a nice little mirror. But it's not a mirror to this veil, the body, the flesh. It's a mirror to what? The soul. And she's kind of like, 
do. She doesn't like what she sees. Have patience with me, Elizabeth. Do not desert me, though this veil must be between us here on earth. Now, this veil, that refers literally to the piece of fabric. But I think it also refers more metaphorically to maybe some of these other veils. Darkness, obscurity, the body, the flesh. Be mine, and hereafter there shall be no veil over my face. No darkness between our souls. Right? Hereafter. It's not a word we use very much today. When we do use it, we kind of use it as a noun. Not as it's being used here, as an adverb. A noun how? In the great hereafter, or in the hereafter. That is, in the what is here after death. All right? So he says, I got to wear it now, and if you're patient with me, hereafter, when we die, then there will be no veil over my face. There will be nothing between us. As I said, St. Paul said, now we see through, but through a glass darkly, but then face to face, okay? And we shall know as we are known. He says there will be no darkness between our souls. How can there be darkness between souls? Especially, I mean, they're about to get married. I've been married over 33 years. I don't know everything my wife thinks. I don't know everything in her soul. Why not? Because my soul's somewhere here, and hers is somewhere there. And they are somewhat separated, even though in the you know, Christian tradition, the two become one kind of a thing. Here, they're still somewhat separated. He says, it is but a mortal veil. It, this, <coughs> or this, it's not for eternity. Okay, it's but a mortal veil. How long is he going to live? We find out he lives to be a ripe old age. We're never told how, how ripe that is. You know, the psalmist and the proverb driver of the Old Testament say, you know, it's given to man to live three score and ten, if he's lucky, four score. So 80 years. So, we, you know, life expectancy is really going up. People today are living to be 95 and 100 pretty easily. But what's 95 and 100 compared to eternity? Because the eternity means time. And the E means out of. It's a drop in the bucket. Take that back. It's a drop in the ocean. Okay. Bear with me for 50, 60 years. And then she says, lift the veil but once. Kind of like, whoop. A little, show you my face real quickly. Never. It cannot be. And she leaves. She walks out of his life. She never gets married. He never gets married. Right? And what are we told? Big long paragraph on 395. What goes on between Mr. Hooper, Parson Hooper, and the people in the town from that moment on, he walks along the street during the day. He goes to the general store or whatever. He sees little kids playing in the street. What do they do when they see him? They run, shrieking. People no longer welcome him into their homes. They don't say hello to him on the street. He's like the proverbial, you know, uh, quote unquote bum that people you know see on the street and they walk aside to the other side of the street so they don't have to be confronted. Okay? 
right? But we're told he's a powerful preacher. People come from far and wide. People on their deathbeds cry aloud for him. Top of 396. Would not yield their breath till he appeared. Though ever as he stooped to whisper consolation, they shudder at the veil so near their own. They shudder at the veil, the black veil he's wearing, that is so near their own. What's their own veil? The few minutes of life they have left. So, he's on his deathbed. And who's nursing him along? I said in my first class that she had died. She hadn't died. Elizabeth. He's on his deathbed, and she's there taking care of him. And the minister of Westbury comes up, paragraph 50, and says, Venerable Father Hooper. Hooper. What does venerable mean? Worthy to be venerated. To venerate something is almost to worship it. It's to ascribe great respect and honor to it. But it also means wise. Because he lived to an old age. Venerable Father Hooper, the moment of your release is at hand. Are you ready for the lifting of the veil that shuts in time from eternity? Notice, the thing that shuts in time from eternity is like a little thin piece of fabric. Because really, how easy is it for us to become unalive? It's pretty easy. It doesn't take much for somebody to die. And Father Hooper, we're told, at first replies merely by a feeble motion of his head. Why feeble? Because he's so old and he's nearly dead. Just kind of nods. And then he says, Yea, my soul hath a patient weariness until that veil be lifted. Yep, my soul hath a patient weariness. That is, I've been enduring this for a long time. I'm ready to die. And Reverend Clark, who is the minister of Westbury, says, and is it fitting that a man so given to prayer of such a blameless example, holy indeed in thought, so far as mortal judgment may pronounce, that is, it appears to us, is it fitting that a father in the church should leave a shadow on his memory that may seem to blacken a life so pure? What's the shadow? What's the blacken? The veil. Come on, let us lift up the veil and see your face before you die. Before the veil of eternity be lifted, let me cast aside this black veil from your face. Now what is the reason for Parson Clark, Mr. Clark, for doing this? I think it's just curiosity. I think there's part of him that really wonders, is, is, does he really have a face behind there? And what happens? Reverend Mr. Clark leans over and grabs the bottom corners of the veil and starts to pull. And old Parson Hooper, with his dying strength, grabs his hands and pulls them down and sits upright. Never! Dark old man, with what horrible crime upon your soul are you now passing to the judgment? Well, earlier he said, so far as mortal judgment may pronounce, Mortal judgment. That's judgment down here. What has he just suggested with that last part? With what horrible crime upon your soul are you now passing to the judgment? He is passing judgment on him there. Okay? Parson Hooper. His breath heaves, rattles in his throat. This is the proverbial death rattle. In the Middle Ages and the Renaissance period, the death rattle was thought to be the soul escaping the body. And it kind of goes as it leaves. He sits up and he says, Why do you tremble at me alone? Turning his veiled face round the circle of pale spectators. 
So it's not just, you know, the minister of Westbury and Elizabeth. There's a whole crowd of people there. And he stops. And when he says this, he turns and looks at every face. Why do you tremble at me alone? Tremble also at each other. And then he asks us, he asks a series of questions. Have men avoided me, and women shown no pity, and children screamed and fled, only for my black veil? He says, really? Has wearing a black handkerchief across my face really made everybody avoid me for the last 50 years? What? But the mystery which it obscurely typifies. Notice, the mystery which it mysteriously typifies. Okay? By saying the mystery is obscurely typified, he's saying it's not clear. But the mystery is a type, and that type will be fulfilled, perfected, completed later on. What but the mystery which it obscurely typifies has made this piece of crepe so awful? He's, this, he's almost saying, Hawthorne didn't have the language. This piece of crepe, it's like a Rorschach test. You ever taken a Rorschach test, ink blot? You get a bottle of ink, drop a blot on a piece of paper, and you show it to a bunch of different people, and guess what you get? A whole bunch of different answers. What does it look like? Okay? This veil is like a Rorschach test, he is essentially suggesting. To each person. And then he asks, or he makes three statements. When the friend shows his inmost heart to his friend. Okay. And then you have to part, supply the when the friend, etc. for the next part. When the lover shows his inmost heart to his best beloved. When man does not vainly shrink from the eye of his creator loathsomely treasuring up the secret of his sin. So three win clauses. When this happens, when this happens, when this happens, then what? Deem me a monster for the symbol beneath which I have lived and died. You can think I'm a monster when a friend reveals his innermost secrets, his deepest, darkest desires of his heart to his best friend. You can deem me a monster when two lovers reveal to each other everything about themselves. You can deem me a monster what? When man the man there is collective when all people don't do what? Don't try to hide from God. Their particular choice, you know. No, I'll give you everything, God, but this one, this is mine. You, you can't have this sin back. Why? Because I look around me and lo, on every visage a black veil. Now you could say, read that literally and say, well, that's because... He's looking through a black veil, so there's a black veil, and there's a black veil, and there's a black veil, and there's a black veil. Or it could be, what else does he mean? Why did he put on the black veil? Okay. Why did he put it on originally? What was his first homily about? His first sermon about when he put on the veil? Secret sin. Is it typifying the quote-unquote black veil that each person wears? The black veil of not being honest with each other and not being honest with God. And so he puts it on, and what do people do? They run and shriek. Why? Because it is... Hamlet suggest, suggested play acting is it's a mirror and what does the mirror show it doesn't show 
this, it shows what's in here. And they're kind of like, Ugh! It's, it's the DMV license picture mirror of the soul. We, we, we want the soul to look better than that. Because those pictures never come out good. Okay? There was a novel written in the mid-1970s, complete knockoff of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Total ripoff by um, Terry Brooks called Sword of Shannara. And he's written, I don't know, a thousand novels afterwards, all based upon it. The Sword of Shannara, I used to teach in my fantasy lit course. The Sword of Shannara is good for one reason. I mean, the writing's not bad, but again, he completely steals from Tolkien. Except for, you know, the, the great wizard in there is, isn't, you know, named Gandalf or some other great um, Norse name. No, he gets the name for the great wizard from... Um, the 1970s um, anti-drug uh, like counseling centers, Al-Anon. And the wizard is named Al-Anon. Anyways, the really cool thing that he does in this story is you find out at the end the sword that this guy, Shay Shannara, is, or you have to find out later his last name, Shannara. Um, that he's trying to get. He's thinking this sword is going to be like Excalibur. You know, you use the sword and you just can't be defeated. The turn, however, is that in order to wield the sword, you have to be able to wield the sword. And what does that mean? The sword shows you yourself. It really shows you it's like you pick up the sword and you hold on to it. And as long as you hold on to it, the sword plays in your own little private virtual reality right in front of you. Everything you've done in your life. Good and bad. All the people you've slighted, everybody you've ever thought a nasty thought about, everybody you've ever said a nasty word about, everybody you've ever thought is like that piece of gum down on the floor. Just something to be stepped on or stepped over. Obviously, it takes a certain amount of strength to keep holding on to that sword. Because what do you have to do? You've got to accept what you see. You've got to say, yep, that's really me. That's what the Black Veil is doing. Right? Notice the effect on the people that he is speaking to. While his auditors, I've been teaching this thing 15 years, and it's almost like the first time I've noticed this was this morning, this last paragraph. While his auditors shrank from one another in mutual affright. Okay? He's lying on his deathbed. There's people in a semicircle around him. And what do they do when he says, Lo, I look around me, and on every visage, a black veil. It's like they suddenly turn to the person next to him and shies away. Why? There's a monster. It's a monster with a black veil. And the person next to him turns and falls away. Because that person, it's like they're all wearing veils. They're affrighted of each other. Father Hooper fell back upon his pillow, a veiled corpse with a faint smile lingering on his lips. Is the faint smile, ha, got the dirty bastards. Could be, okay. Or it could be, it's the faint smile he's always had. We're always told about he has this glimmering smile, okay. So the big question then becomes, what did it mean? <laughs> it's a parable, right? Parables are stories told to make a message clear to those who are told what the message is. What's the message? Okay, jump for about 10 minutes. Faulkner. Um, we'll finish Faulkner and get into 
Flannery O'Connor on Wednesday, because remember Monday's fall break. Faulkner was a Nobel Prize winning novelist of the early 20th century. Won the Nobel Prize, 1950, pretty much after he stopped writing his great novels. He didn't, he didn't write any great novels after, I think it was about 1940, 1941. This short story is written in 1939. Um, in his Nobel Prize winning speech, he said, you know, what he was trying to do in all of his works is get at the heart of humanity, to, to, to get at what really moves and motivates us. He also said he was a novelist because he wasn't a poet. And he wasn't a poet because the poets used the least number of words to say the most stuff, or the most meaningful stuff. And if you take the flip side of that, that means novelists use the most number of words to say the least amount of stuff. I don't think that's true. but So we have here Barn Burning. Barn Burning is set in, I think I've got that spelled correctly, I'm not positive, Yakna Patafa County, which is an imaginary county that Faulkner created in Mississippi. Born and raised and died in Mississippi. Right? Almost all of his novels are set in Mississippi. There's a few where people leave Mississippi and go up to the Northeast for a while and then come back down, or they go to LA and then they come back to Mississippi. Right? They're all set, almost all set, post Civil War or just before the Civil War to most of them the 1890s. Some of them are set all the way up into about the 1920s. Right? Sanctuary, for example, is. Um, the Snopes family, we're going to meet Abner Snopes and his son, Colonel Sartoris, early on. The Snopes family is a family that he kind of traces throughout many of his novels. They're like a, a big local family, like the Murphy family in Murfreesboro. I actually had the two twin sons of whoever the Murphy is in a class about 20 years ago, um, descendants of the guy who founded the town and such. Right? So this short story begins with a long first paragraph set in a general store. And I know it'll take a little bit of time, but I want to read this paragraph. Look at how long the second sentence is. The store in which the justice of the peace's court was sitting smelled of cheese. The boy, crouched on his nail keg at the back of the crowded room, knew he smelled cheese and more. From where he sat, he could see the rank shelves, close packed with the solid, squat, dynamic shapes of tin cans whose labels his stomach read. Not from the lettering, which meant nothing to his mind, from the scarlet devils and the silver curve of fish. This, the cheese, which he knew he smelled, and the hermetic meat, which his intestines believed he smelled, coming in intermittent gusts, momentary and brief, between the other constant one. The smell and sense just a little of fear, because mostly of despair and grief, the old fierce pull of blood. Everything from the boy to blood, it's one sentence. That is typical Faulkner. Big, long, convoluted, complex sentences. He could not see the table where the justice sat, before which his father and his father's enemy. And then we get a little bit of editorial omniscience. That is, the narrator is telling us what the boy is thinking. His father's enemy. Our enemy, he thought in that despair. Aaron, mine and his boat. He's my father stood, but he could hear them, the two of them. Okay, so what have we been told through description about the boy? We've been given some facts. What do we know about him? Can he read? No. Why not? Okay, but why, how do we know that? Yeah. He sees the pictures in the lettering which meant nothing to his mind. Okay? So he's illiterate. He can't read. What else? How can he smell food that is in hermetically sealed cans?
can't. What's doing the smelling? Is it his nose? It's his stomach, his intestines. So what's that telling us? He's hungry. The kid's hungry. He sees the image of the fish on the can and his stomach rumbles. Okay? So he's hungry, he's illiterate. How does he speak if we take his thoughts to represent his speech? Arab. What's the un mean? What kind of speech is that? Is this a upper class member of society? No. Mine and his and both. The in on both of those okay, is telling us lower class, uneducated. So we hear the justice of the peace. Well, what proof have you, Mr. Harris? And whoever Mr. Harris is, he replies. I told you that hog got into my corn, caught it up, sent it back to him. He had no fence that would hold it. I told him so, warned him. Next time I put the hog in my pen, so that's two times the hog's been out. When he came to get it, I gave him enough wire to patch up his pen. So notice Mr. Harris is a pretty nice guy. He gives him wire to fix his fence. I gave him still rolled on a spool in his yard, he said, when I went down there. Next time I put the hog up, I kept it. Rode down to his house, saw the wire I gave him. So one, two, three, four times that evening, um, I told him he could have the hog when he paid me a dollar pound fee. That evening, a nigger came with the dollar and got the hog. He was a strange nigger. He said to tell you wood and hay can burn. I said, what? That what he said to you. That what he said to tell you, the nigger said. Wood and hay can burn. That night, my barn burned. I got the stock out, but I lost the barn. Well, where's the nigger? Have you got him? He's a strange nigger, I tell you. I don't know what became of him, but that's not proof. Don't you see that's not proof? What's the justice of the peace getting at? Bring him in, make him testify. Why? He's an eyewitness. But he can't find him. So all Mr. Harris says is hearsay. Well, bring that boy up. Not him, that is not the older one, the younger one. And the boy starts to walk up. People move aside. And the boy thinks. He aims for me to lie, he thought. Who's the he? His father. His father. And I'll have to do it. What's your name, boy? Colonel Sartorius Snopes. Now, Colonel Sartorius Snopes, in Faulkner's mythology, I mean, he's like George Washington, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Teddy Roosevelt. I mean, great person revered by everybody, which is why the Justice of the Peace says, well, I reckon anybody named for Colonel Sartorius in this country can't help but tell the truth. And the boy thinks, enemy, enemy. But notice he doesn't look really at the Justice of the Peace. He could not see that the Justice's face was kindly, nor discern that his voice was troubled when he spoke to a man named Harris. You want me to question this boy? And Harris said, no, why not? If he has to question the boy, what is he doing to the boy? Essentially. Why can a court not force a husband or wife to testify against a husband or wife? Conflict of interest. The boy's got a conflict of interest. Also, What's the father on trial for? Burning the barn. The next page, we're going to be told they moved 12 times in the boy's 10 years. We're not told how many times they moved before the boy was born. Because the boy has older brothers and an older brother and sisters. All right? The implication is if they've had to move. If they've had to move 12 times in 10 years, they probably were moving a bit before that. So what does that tell us about his father? He's got a bit of an anger problem. You're going to make a 10-year-old boy testify against his father? 
What's the father likely to do? If he has anger issues. Okay, we will um, stop there. And we're going to pick up very briefly on 481 on Wednesday. Probably be a quiz on Wednesday, going over those terms of fiction, you know, setting, plot, point of view, that kind of stuff. Um, as well as the little bit of introduction to Hawthorne and Mr. Black Veil, a little bit of introduction to Faulkner and Barn Burning.